Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to present to you this, uh, in this forum, uh, still morning, uh, the Jubilee project and its current performance. I was a bit, uh, a bit taken back by the opening comments by David, saying that uh, the investment community out there look negatively on uh, small oil companies taking on large development projects and uh, sees it as uh, a risky business. Uh, yes, the oil business as a whole is risky. And what this talk is going to show you is that there are three small companies. I, uh, we affectionately call them mama and papa companies who have actually taken on a mega deep water development project and <coughs> have done it to world-class standard and actually the the fact will speak louder than words. So without further delay, I will uh, start with the uh, Jubilee and the content of uh, the talk will go through a brief history of oil industry in Ghana and that will actually set the scene and uh, give you an opportunity to appreciate the achievements of Jubilee in Ghana. Then we'll present you the Jubilee field itself uh, what it is, and uh, the Jubilee Development Project, what the content of the development is. The field's performance today, how is it doing today? Has it met the expectation? Has it lived up to the expectation that were set at the, on, at the development stage and the planning stage? And it will be unfair not to highlight the many achievements in terms of local content and shared pro prosperity that Tolo has brought to Ghana and the oil industry as a whole indeed has brought to the communities in Ghana. And I will summarize the discussions uh, and the talk and uh, take questions from there. Okay, the oil industry in Ghana. So oil exploration has started since the 1900 in Ghana and in 1957 Ghana gained its independence. In 1970 uh, a small oil field has been discovered in the South Pound. It's actually still producing. Uh, it's producing about 500 barrels uh, on a Mopu uh, offshore Ghana. In the, in the early 80s, Ghana established a national oil company, which actually doubles up as a regulator for the oil and gas business. So the GNPC, Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, uh, is a national oil company as well as the regulator set up to actually frame the legal and fiscal uh, uh, side of activities, EMP activities in the country. In the 21st century, starting in 2000, a lot of deep water exploration started in Ghana and out of this flurry of activities was the Jubilee discovery in 2007. 2007, the Mahogany and One and the Shedwa One wells discovered the Jubilee field, which I will be presenting in uh, uh, shortly in coming slides. In June, July, that was in June, July 2007, and from 2008 through 2010, actually, the development of the Jubilee pro uh, field has taken place, and along those same lines, with the discovery of Jubilee, the increase in act exploration activities had made several more discoveries uh, in Ghana some of which are listed some of which are listed here uh, there are several uh, this uh, Tik, Odum, Chinoboa, Enera, Akasa and several op operators Hess, uh, ENI, uh, Luke Oil, several operators on the ground in Ghana have made the uh, discovery some of which at this point are still uh, uh, somewhat small to be developed in a deep water setting and they are still being appraisal. But others, as you probably have seen in the press last week, uh, are going ahead. The Tulo, uh, the, the Tolo, Tuneboa, Nera, and Entom Field, called 10, has been approved by government for a development. But that's another mega project for Tolo, which I'm not going to cover in this talk. So, the Jubilee field itself. Jubilee is located 130 kilometers southwest of the Takuradi port city. It discovered in 2007, as I mentioned earlier, 
with a P50 reserve estimate well above 370 million, 70 million barrel recoverable in water depth ranging from 1,000 to 1,700 meters. The field is unitized between two blocks. One block, the West Cape Three Point, which is uh, operated by uh, Cosmos Energy, a very, very small explorer, as well as uh, the other side, which is uh, the Tano Block, uh, Deep Water Tano Block, which is operated by Tolo. Jubilee Straddle, the two blocks, as you can see here, this is the West Cape Three Point, and this is the Deep Water Tano Block, and Jubilee Straddle, the two blocks, which brings another interesting dimension to the development of the field unitization, which is uh, a small piece of uh, activity that most of you know about. I'm, I'm being sarcastic. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually a complex uh, uh, legal and uh, technical battle that, we, uh, that uh, takes place. But you will see, despite all that, Jubilee Project has been uh, delivered in three and a half years pretty much ranking uh, in some of the, the records out there for mega oil projects. So Jubilee itself is composed of five major reservoirs, uh, which we name MH1 through MH5. Now, the project, the development approach taken for the project in order to fast track it is a phased development, which means we targeted the key, the, the two biggest reservoirs, develop it first, because even with that, the project is uh, massively economic. So we targeted those two reservoirs and started out developing it. And as we are producing with those, we are actually continuing the development. And you will see as I progress through the talk, the extra phases of the development that we are going through. So out of the two major reservoirs that we started off with, which is the MH1 and the MH, uh, we call it MH1 and MH4, you will see the recoverable per well. We have 10 wells in the phase one development, five producer, five injector, and the recovery per well in this, this uh, reservoir is 26 million barrel roughly. And in the MH1 reservoir, we started off in the phase one uh, uh, project with seven wells with 16 million barrel recoverable. Why is that important? There is a cutoff at which, below which, you really cut off mean uh, uh, the well recovery, the recovery per well. There is a cutoff below which the project will not be economic. So overall, then if you average them up, it provides 22 million barrel per, per well. And when I say per well, it's not just the producers, right? You average the, the, the 17 wells that we started off with in the phase one. So whether it's injector, water injector, or gas injector, or producer, the 17 wells give us about 22 million barrel recoverable. If you look at it from the producer side alone, if you take the production wells alone, each producer will recover 52 million barrel of oil from MH4 and 28 from, uh, from MH1. So what's the, that's the wells and the reservoir side. I will come to the type of wells that are going to recover those mega million barrels for us. But uh, when we do produce through the wells from the reservoir, we have to uh, lift it. And there comes the subsea architecture that allows us to lift it toward the FPSO. The setup is such that you have the subsea trees, which are linked to the manifold through jumpers, and uh, then uh, produce through flexible flow lines and risers to the FPSO. And that really represents the subsea and the, the subsea part of the project, of course, with the FPSO part and the well side making up the three major components of the mega project that was Jubilee. The project was delivered in 40 months, one and a half years, three and a half years, I wish, well, three and a half years. And uh, what were the key uh, enablers from human perspective from relationship and from working together perspective that actually made that happen. Earlier on in the project, everybody realized that every, everybody realized that we need a share objective and an alignment with the government and the GNPC. We realized that no single company, given that all three companies were small explorers, none of them has the, the, the whole capability to do it on its own. 
So we realized we needed to pick one, uh, the best from each company, which is actually what happened. So the involvement of each of all partners in the team and regular interaction amongst the team members has enabled a coherent working together and everybody moving together at the same pace. And another decision that was made earlier on to enable the project to be delivered fast is the use of proven technology, functional specs, and experienced contractors. We don't want to reinvent the wheel and we don't want to be too fancy and too clever for our own goods. So we use a known technology, smart people out there to get the job done right and do it right for the first time. And early start of the development work. The development has been decided on the basis of a couple of, a couple of wells. That's a pretty risky bet, uh, right? And the development having been decided the front-end engineering and design work started and everything was running in parallel. And yes, that was a fairly risky approach, but that's the, there are two ways to shorten a development project schedule. The first one is you delay, you do short appraisal or you parallel appraisal as well as the design and the engineering. And that's what uh, the approach that was done here. The development was decided early, shortening the appraisal cycle and hence the phased approach to development, which was adopted. So we will be learning more and more about the reservoirs as we go through, and therefore broadening and increasing the size of the development. It's a strategy which has worked for Jubilee. There is a rapid decision making, right? Uh, you actually had to accept to be wrong. So the 8020 solution was accepted as, was adopted as acceptable. You probably write 80% of the time the other 20% of the time, you make sure you are not wrong on something major. But if you stay there and uh, get paralyzed, you know, uh, what decision, decision paralyzes or whatever it's called, you get paralyzed uh, and scared from making decision, this project will not have been delivered in the time frame. So if you look at the timeline, the license was awarded uh, between 2004 and 2006. The field was discovered in 2007. And in 2008, the IPT project, the Integrated Project Team, that's the name that was given to the project team. And how was it done? We picked the best from all three companies. We isolated them almost like form, forming a separate company and give them the mandates to go ahead and deliver. So the Integrated Project Team was formed. The phase, the phase one development plan was approved in 2009 and in 2010, uh, the first, the FPSO arrived in Ghana in June of 2010, and the first oil, the Ghana started producing oil on the 28th of November uh, 2010. If you look at this timeline, you will see a couple of inherent risks in this one. The plan of development was only approved in the middle of 2009, yet the project has started. That means you were, you were willing to put some option money on the table. Uh, on the basis that you trust the government to approve the project at some point in time. That, again, is uh, another bold uh, uh, movement that enabled the project to be delivered on a record pace. Okay, it's been delivered on what we, we are considering a record pace. How does it rank out there amongst the mega projects that were executed in deep water? You will see for yourself some of the major deep water development here in terms of when the, when, when the cons when the field was discovered in an award for appraisal and development, and how long it took to execute. So if you look at Jubilee, Jubilee with its 14 months run among the top quartile, and that's across all operators, including ma major, op you know, mega oil companies. So that's, uh, that enable us to, to qualify Jubilee as one of the most successful uh, deep water development projects in the world. Right. As I was mentioning earlier, the structure that enabled this to work fairly well in terms of team was Toro was designated as the unit operator with specific task of liaising with the government, designing and drilling and completing the wells, and manage the production operations once the field come on stream. That's what was considered uh, the strength for this company based on its culture, its people, and its uh, it uh, 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 skills, know-how. Cosmos, on the other hand, 
or designated as the technical operator in charge of running the project team and delivering the project aspect of things, which is sub-C and FPSO, and managing the, the planning and the development. And Adaco, which was actually probably the most experienced of the three small companies, has, has seconded a lot of its experienced people within both teams, within both of these teams. And the management, at the, there are subcommittees that make technical decisions, technical finance, finance and contract and gas export, and those committees make the decisions and recommendations at the ground level, at the coal phase. And the unit operating committee sets strategy and controls, and then there's a joint management committee at the top. So this is the overall project management structure that delivered Jubilee. This committee, this structure is still in place today, but given the project has been delivered, the IPT has been disbanded, and Anadako has pulled most of its operators, to, uh, its uh, technical staff. Tolo is the operator and has been uh, since first oil, building up a very strong and huge uh, uh, operations in terms of people. Actually, it's a company from scratch, if you look at Tolo Ghana, it only had nine people in uh, 2007. Today we are we are 395 people, of which 89% are locals. But I will come back to some of those statistics, so you see how we built a company from scratch within five years. So, by what measure are we qualifying Jubilee as uh, successful? Uh, obviously, you can qualify the project as successful through the normal classical project execution key performance indicators, right? Uh, EHS performance, the cost, the schedule. The quality and reliability and uptime of the project once the FPS will come on stream, and those are the technical ones. But the most important, some of the most important for us are the non-measurable, the intangible, I call it, uh, aspect of the project, right? The organization that was built, I mentioned going from nine people to 395, roughly 400 people in five years. The environmental assessment and the safeguard that were put to actually preserve the environment the fishery impact limiting or, or, or avoiding any impact on the fishery because the fisherman, there's a livelihood, a, a big industry of a bunch of people who live off of fishery. A lot of new regulations have to establish, which means working with the government to establish new regulations for a big offshore activity in the oil and gas industry. And the stakeholder management and share benefit, we call it share prosperity, and that's a key to keeping the stakeholders and continue keeping our license to operate uh, in the environment, the community we are in. A lot of local employment and local content, a lot of contracts awarded to local people, a lot of uh, local uh, engineers and, and uh, 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 staff, uh, qualified staff being used in the company, 89% of local uh, employees. And then we are initiating a gas industry. I'll highlight quickly some of those as we go through. The Jubilee FPSO itself. I heard a lot about FPSO this morning, and I'm not going to dwell on hours, but it is a converted FPSO. It's a conversion. Uh, it's a large VLCC that was converted by Modec uh, at the Duran shipyard in Singapore. It was leased with the option to purchase, and we did purchase it in December 2012. And uh, MODEC provide the operating and maintenance services, and uh, we kept that going for now. The conversion took place uh, in between 2009, November, and arrived in Ghana in June of 2010, after which it went through a short commissioning period before first oil in November 2010. Characteristics, we have 1.65 million barrel of liquid storage capacity, 120,000 barrel production capacity, 230 barrel of water injection, 160 million standard cubic feet of gas injection, re-injection or export, and I will come back to that. If Jubilee is producing 112, 114 today, it's probably because the gas export scheme that was promised to us, the gas export infrastructure has not been completed as promised by uh, by the government, and therefore we are constrained on the, um, the amount of gas that we can dispose into the reinjection wells. Otherwise, we'll be at 120, 125,000 uh, uh, bar thousand barrel today. And obviously, there is uh, an EHS implication 
if if we were not environmentally friendly and conscious we could have flared the associated gas but that's a no no in uh, in total policy so we have taken the decision to uh, add another gas injector which is coming on stream in uh, august to release all the back pressures and uh, eventually produce at or above the design capacity by uh, the end of the third quarter so we have uh, uh, some of the other uh, tidbits about the FPSO, 65 meters wide, 330 meters long, 17 modules weighing over uh, 12,500 tons, and nine anchor legs in 1,300 meters of water. Okay, the subsea, infra the subsea infrastructure, you will see some of the characteristics here, 14 miles of uh, umbilicals, uh, 41 rigid jumpers and flow lines, 29 miles of flow lines, trees, tree, this should actually read 17 because we have 17 words, typo for my assistant. Electrical flying leads, 112, uh, 112 uh, uh, electrical flying leads, still flying leads, manifolds, and uh, so on and so forth. This is actually from the phase one. Since phase one, we have actually executed another phase of the project, phase 1A, which contain eight wells, nine pro, um, uh, five producers, and three injectors. So this infrastructure has increased since uh, since phase one was executed. The offloading we heard also a lot about offloading today. Uh, I think uh, the, I have a colleague, by the way, in uh, in the audience. She's uh, more of an expert in offloading than I am. It's uh, Michelle. <laughs> it's Michelle, which is why I'm going to skip the offloading part so she doesn't find me wrong. <laughs> but these are export tankers. I think they are direct uh, direct tankers. They come and uh, load the crude, 950,000 barrel uh, parcels that they take off. Uh, obviously, depending on our production levels, uh, uh, they come uh, uh, every other week or so. So if you look at the well engineering side, that Tolo was uh, responsible uh, for doing at the initial stages of the project. Uh, looking, looking at it, back in 2008, Tolo had not drilled a single deep water well before. But what we did was we assembled quickly a team of experienced people who delivered the wells as per standard and per specification. And you will see later how, how production has been and how the wells are performing. And uh, being the asset manager, I'm well placed to, to know that a lot of people were concerned about the initial performance of the wells, but we have passed that a long time ago, and the wells, we have well potential way more than the FPSO can handle, which is the place we want to be. And we, 14 new wells were drilled uh, at the, and we, use, we reused three uh, exploration and appraisal wells. So that's uh, the 17 was in the phase one development, drill 47 kilometers of new well bore. And the completion type, uh, the, the well budget was 50% of the overall project budget, about 1,600, about, uh, 1600 uh, million dollars, uh, 1.6 billion dollars. Uh, and uh, you will see how we perform against this uh, approved budget later. We adopted a very simple, uh, uh, design for the well, that's uh, frack and pack, case hole frack and pack, which was very prominent in Gulf of Mexico, so you will feel the influence of Anadarko in that decision there. And uh, so frack and pack completion were adopted. We actually committed to the rig way before we had a, the plan of development approved. That goes along with what I was saying earlier about uh, uh, putting some option money on the table in uh, hope or with confidence that the POD will approve, will be approved. So we committed to the Eric Raud rig, which started drilling and completing wells way before the plan of development was, was approved. So that's how we were able to accelerate uh, uh, the, pro the project and have sufficient well at first oil. That's all good, but what's the infrastructure and the logistics and the sides uh, uh, activities that have enabled us to develop uh, to deliver the project you will know you will uh, as you can appreciate it there was no infrastructure in the in the country 
to actually sustain uh, a heavy activity of a mega deep water development. So everything has to be done from scratch. My one of my favorite I started with is this road. This is before and this is after. And we had to use this road to transport some of our equipment. So we have to do everything from building road to setting up a proper aviation uh, industry, uh, both from the fixed wings as well as the halo, uh, in order to transport passengers. If you look at 2010 alone, we have transported 15,000 15, passengers uh, through fixed wings. We, we had two planes that was doing the back and forth uh, between Takuradi and, uh, and Accra. And we adopted for EHS region. Takuradi to Accra is about uh, three hours drive. But to actually minimize uh, in the risk on uh, EHS in, on people, there's no driving. So we want to avoid road fatalities. It's a policy of no driving. So we had to set up the, infra the, the, the system to fly people out there. And so from constructing one part of the airport and renting it and all the way to renting the, the planes and setting up the, the logistic uh, to transport people. So that's the impact or the size of the activities that have to happen in order to deliver the project. The technical aspect is one thing, but setting up in a company from scratch from nine people to 400 people is another, and actually building infrastructure and capability in the country is a third. And the infrastructure is only one. You also now have to work in building the legislations and the regulations to go along with a new nascent industry. So that's, uh, that's what makes Jubilee a fascinating and uh, unique project. Along with setting up the infrastructure and uh, building up uh, the, 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 the regulations and everything else, we have to mine the welfare and the prosperity of the community and the people of Ghana. So we have a very def defined policy of awarding every contract that can be awarded to a local company has to be awarded to a local company in order to share the prosperity of the oil business. So we design, we actually inventorize our services. What you see here, uh, let me go from the in, the in to the out. Very, very specialized services, right? Uh, FPSO, well, seismic, uh, front-end engineering design, and all that. So clearly, that requires a lot of experience and international contractors. So uh, for now, it's still fairly close uh, system into which the local contractors and local uh, uh, companies cannot quite get into. The outer circle is the direct services. Anything from ROV to tank cleaning to lifting equipment to production chemicals and all that, yes, the the contractors, the local contractors and companies are getting into this and gradually building experience and confidence to actually provide these services. And on the, the outer ring are some of the indirect services, which actually pretty much is uh, uh, over 90, 95% local. And I will show the numbers shortly. And those are transporting personnel, medical services, IT, telecommunication, custom clearance, logistic training, a lot of these are provided by local companies. That's the system and the structure and the analysis to provide uh, local and share prosperity to the people uh, of the country we are operating in. Right, if you look at it by the numbers, right? So if you look at it by the numbers in 2009, uh, this is the number of uh, contract awarded to Ghanaian companies. By 2012, this is the number. And if you look at the value of the, the, the contract, uh, contract which are, uh, it doesn't show the million dollars, but uh, in terms of a million dollars, these are the, the value of the contract awarded to local companies. You will see in the conclusion slide that the, the industry and the production from Jubilee oil production has increased the gross domestic product of Ghana by 14%. So that's the impact of Jubilee and oil production on, on uh, the prosperity of the country. Coming back to Jubilee as a project, uh, we need to measure how well did we do compared to 
the normal metrics that we, we, we rank ourselves against in project execution. At sanction, the project was $3.15 billion. The FPSO, of course, is lead, so the FPSO uh, operating cost and the FPSO cost has not been added there. But at sanction, it's $3.15 billion, and at the outturn, we have spent $3.3 billion, which make it 5% only or, or less above budget. And that 5% is only because we had a train wreck in one of the well. We had a mechanical failure during completion, uh, which had us redrill or recompleted one of the wells. And the other half of this uh, uh, increase is due to a scope change in, uh, in the well engineering uh, scope. If you look at the facilities, we actually underspent on the, the facilities forecast. So that's how the project perform against the KPI of cost. And uh, on the EHS side, you have the total recordable incident, which is less than 1.5 uh, on the goal of 2.5, which is fairly the standard in the industry. We have worked 11.2 million man hours for this 1.52 total recordable in, uh, uh, incident. And if you look at the long term, the LTI rate, we had 0 0.45, which is again below the target, uh, which is close to the industry average. We only have five uh, lost time injury during the entire project. Five lost time injury. Nobody got killed. Uh, maybe somebody could cut the finger or, or five lost time injury during the entire project. This 1.2 million man hours uh, of work done. And you can imagine some of the complex activities that are taking place in uh, drilling, completing, hooking up, and putting on the installation out there. So how is the field doing today? We've done all that uh, in 2000, between 2008 and 2010. So uh, has it lived up to its expectation? How is it producing today? And that's what we have. I mentioned to you earlier, we had phase 1A, which has already added five wells. But the field now has uh, uh, five wells, of which only three are on stream. Uh, the field now has 20 wells, 11 producers, seven water injectors, and two gas injectors. Production, as I speak, today is uh, 113,500. So we normally hover between 112 and 114. And uh, again, it's due to the inability to dispose of all the associated gas. As soon as somebody leaves that tomorrow, uh, the field will be at 120 plus. And the water injection, we are producing at 230,000 barrel with 93% uptime. The other things to note about Jubilee, uh, the performance of Jubilee, is that even within the first year of production, the uptime on the field is 90, was 98%. After we finish the commissioning and debugging of the system, the, which happened within the first six months, the uptime, production uptime is 98%. There are very few projects where, uh, even if it's not an FPSO, where the uptime of a complex plant like an FPSO can be kept at 98%. Our target was 95, but we beat it by staying up 98% of the time. So as of the end of May, we have produced 60 seven and a half million barrel and lifted uh, 68, ca 68 cargoes, right? And so production performance on the right-hand side curve, the area plot that you see is the performance of the field, stack plot well by well, and compared to the solid line, which is the budget, and the cumulatives are these lines that you see here. And on the x-axis is date, rate is here, cumulative is here. Yes, most people actually realize that earlier in the field life, we have had difficulties in keeping the wells uh, at producing, and we had productivity decline, which we got our heads scratching, and ultimately to find out that it was scale, uh, partly scale, partly fines, depending on the side of the reservoir you are, you are in, that are blocking the, the reducing the PI, the productivity indices of the wells. It wasn't easy first to find out the causes of that productivity indices, but we also quickly designed two things, a measure to actually clean up the, the productivity impairment 
And then the second one is a measure to prevent them from happening again. And from that perspective, since then, we have treated the world's regain production and cruising well above our own forecast here. And so the latest I was telling some of the colleagues uh, out there is that uh, we have executed successfully, a, we have designed and tested and executed a mean for cleaning up the world in case they impair again uh, from the back of a boat. That's a major achievement because we are in deep water. We are in 13 plus uh, 100 meters of water depth. Putting equipment on the back of a single boat and deploying four coil tubing reel to connect to the subsea tree and pump acid into them if required uh, is a major achievement which actually has reduced our treatment costs by over 50%. So we can do this acid job. Not just did we reduce the treatment costs, but we also cut down our dependence on rigs. So we don't now need we we don't need a rig to be brought into the field in order to do those acid treatment, and the acid treatment now lasts only uh, uh, two or three days. So it becomes a fairly routine operation that you can do every 24 or, or, or 24 months or so in case the well impairs again, and in case the measure we have designed to prevent them from impairing again uh, do not work. Not that we think it won't work, but it's just another contingency measure that we have added to it. So in terms of the safety performance today for, from the field, uh, you will see the classical triangle here. We had, unfortunately, last year one uh, lost time injury. Uh, really, it was something very funny. The guy caught his, uh, something entered his gloves and caught his uh, hand, the palm of his hand. Rather than just going straight to the, the medic and get it treated, he left it right and he got infected and the, he couldn't use his hand once he get infected we had to classify it as lost time injury so that's the lost time injury that we had last year and if you look at the safety performance observation cards on uh, on safety have been uh, coming in regularly the near misses are being reported properly and so that's the triangle which still uh, by industry standard look pretty impressive year to date uh, knock on wood, we have zero loss time injury and no medical treatment case and uh, safety performance is top on the list uh, as far as TOLO goes and we, we're keeping it up. So as for the fields, the performance on safety and uptime, which you see on the right hand side graphs here, remain solid. And uh, 2012, we have the 98% uptime on oil production system, uh, 95 or so on water injection and similar 97 on gas injection. This year we have had uh, poor, uh, a little bit of bad luck with the water injection system because we lost one pump, one motor failed. So we are replacing it and putting it back on. 12th of July is uh, the date promised to us for uh, the replacement motor. That's why our water injection system here, uptime is around 83%, but the rest of it remain very solid. 93% for gas injection system year to date and 98% still on the oil production system. Who are the people delivering all this great performance? These are the people. These are the people. Uh, the company, as I pointed out earlier, started off with nine people in 2007 and built up 395 people in uh, 2000, as of the end of 2012. And the composition is 11% expatriates, of which I'm actually one, you wouldn't know. And, uh, <laughs> and 89% Ghanaian. And on the management team, we have 35% expatriate and 65% uh, Ghanaian on the management team. The demographics of the team is fairly young. Given that there was no oil industry in the country before, we have recruited people who, which we, are, who we are training from all, uh, from all disciplines, petroleum engineering to finance and, and so on, to HR and so on. In summary, Jubilee, is one of the, at least we, you will agree with, uh, with us that we consider it as one of the most successful deep water projects in the world. Uh, the unique characteristic and the achievement of Jubilee are listed here and they were shared with you during my talk. Uh, many physical and, and institutional infrastructure have to be built, so in the environment was not clear, uh, was not clear cut. Somebody doing this in Gulf of Mexico or North Sea will make it less impressive than doing it somewhere where nothing existed, right? So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, one of the achievements. 
we have a strong local content right and local employment and share prosperity as i was pointing out earlier oil industry and uh, oil production has increased the gdp of ghana by 14 percent so the next phase in the total growth in ghana you probably see it last week uh, the announcement of the 10 project the government approved another mega project uh, pretty much a jubilee look-alike uh, that uh, we are planning to embark on and that's the 10 uh, plan of development which has been in the work for quite some time now and that's another mega project that will be executed in uh, in ghana coming on stream we'll see how fast that one will go uh, whether it, it will beat jubilee so with that i thank you very much that's day one of uh, jubilee first oil and i thank you very much for your attention Okay, uh, well, we are running a bit late, but uh, is any time for a couple of questions, if anybody has one? Please, yeah. yeah thank you for your, uh, my name is uh, Martin Bruins from uh, Petrofac. Uh, thanks for the excellent uh, presentation, uh, quite impressive. Um, I've got a question about your local content policy and the development of local content. Um, I noticed from one of your slides, you said also in the early days, already in the early days, uh, 2007, uh, a lot of contracts have been awarded to local companies. Mm -hmm. But I guess in those early days, this, the, the yellow pages on oil and gas service companies was pretty thin. In, uh, how did you deal with that problem? Right. That's, uh, that's where I refer you to the three circles that we have. And uh, those three circles shows... Uh, right. So you see some of these services? It doesn't need hotels and... Uh, Telecoms and accommodation don't need oil and gas industry, you agree, I'm being facetious. But a lot of those services were consciously awarded to uh, local companies. And gradually, as the oil industry developed, they, they started moving toward the inner circle, which is more oil and gas industry specifics. So that's, that's how we approach the problem. There were some of those where uh, local companies just uh, take on, uh, they set up shop in uh, the country, and that's not really a local company. We don't consider that really a local company, but there are some of those. But the priority was given, it's not 100% local uh, content, uh, priority was given to local companies where, uh, where there is one. So that's a way of putting it. So uh, we started developing the local content, look for, for where we can find the local company and if we don't find, it doesn't mean we'll, we won't get from an external or, or an extern international company. So that's how we prioritize local companies. Where possible, it goes to local companies. Mm -hmm. And okay. you see the numbers have been growing. The numbers have been growing uh, from uh, 2009 to mm -hmm. 2012. Okay, uh, one at the back there. Yves Sharma from uh, Yves Sharma Consulting. Uh, going on on the issue of local companies, what, what, uh, how do you categorize a local company? Is it a registered company in Ghana, a number of employees, paying local taxes? All of Could the above. You? All of the above. <laughs> Is that a government uh, legislation requirement? Uh, there is. You have to register with the Ghana National Petro uh, Company. It used to be GNPC you register with, but now they have created the regulatory body since uh, last year, which is called the Petroleum Commission. So you have to register as an uh, oil and gas service provider with that company. And then we also have our local, our internal registration company where you come to us and tell us your activities and we give you the criteria. And in that sense, actually, Tolo and the Jubilee Partners have created a school, sort of. We call it the Enterprise Development Center, with, uh, we, where we invested about $7 million in building and uh, uh, everything else to try to actually provide the local contractors what we expect from them, a training on how you, you write a proposal, how you bid for contract and all that. So uh, there is a lot of uh, activities going on in that area. 
Because ultimately, the important thing is how much, uh, how many dollars local currency end up with the local nationals, rather than uh, money being transferred to a local company. So, uh, if, for instance, you have, uh, you say it's ninety percent, uh, you said eighty nine, eighty five percent local. Uh, presumably, is that does that also equate to uh, a financial? Uh, 85 percent? No, no, the 89 plus 85 to 89 percent was the employees. Oh, right, employees okay. In total. Thank so you. So in terms of dollars winding up with local companies, this is, this is it. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> well, one more question and then we, I guess we need to move on. Okay. Bob. Bob Waterhouse, RG Petroleum. The, um, the success of the um, Jubilee field is obviously very important to Ghana. Um, how do you balance the rate at which the production builds up and then declines in terms of the kind of corporate social responsibility, the contribution you're making to the local economy? Because it's, you know, in an extreme case, one would have very heavy production early on and the roads would go in and the local economy would benefit. But then as the oil gets depleted, the, the inflow of that work into the local economy would reduce. So there clearly is a kind of a balance between Tullow's ideal discounted cash flow um, kind of you know, costing approach to get revenue in early as opposed to perhaps the government's view of taking things on a slightly more gentle basis to make sure that the, um, the first phase of the project and the second phase you know, comes in over a longer period. I wonder if you know, you've got any kind of comments about that aspect of the the Jubilee projects and the other work that Tallow are doing in Ghana. Okay. The Jubilee itself uh, is ultimately going to have uh, over 42 wells and the FPSO. So there is a lot more project to be executed on the back of this one. We are yet to finish phase 1A, but we already have a plan of development for what we call the full field development, which we actually submitted to the government for approval to drill extra wells to mop up all the reservoirs in the field. So in terms of resources and reserve and production, we have a lot more to come. And uh, so we have uh, built the project for 20, 25 years, which is the license period. So we'll stay on plateau for quite some time, given that we have undersized. In fact, one of my headaches is that it was undersized. And I wish I can uh, push it a lot harder, which is why I'm working on uh, the bottlenecking uh, project, try to push the FPSO to as much as we can. Right. So we, having said that, we will stay on plateau for quite some time. And I do agree with you that we will start coming off of plateau and go into normal decline mode, which is normal for an oil field. So we are <coughs> anticipating so far the government is very proactive in trying to develop, use the oil wealth to develop other industry in the country in order to alleviate or to keep the prosperity going, shifting just the emphasis from oil to other activities uh, with time. So hopefully there will be a lot more successful with the oil industry than there had been in the past with the mining industry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you.